In this video, we'll learn how to combine symmetry elements together and how to construct group multiplication tables. If you recall, in the first video of this series, we defined a group. And essentially, a group is a set of elements that can combine together under some operation that obey these four following rules. We said that molecules, if we can take their symmetry elements, all those symmetry elements will form a group. In a different video, we learn how to assign point groups. So for example, we learned that methylene chloride is contained in the C2V point group because it contains an identity element, C2, sigma V, and sigma V prime. Of the four different rules that the set has to obey, the only one that's obvious is that it contains an identity element, E. The other three aren't obvious. In order to determine whether or not this actually obeys the rules of a group, we have to go through and construct something called a group multiplication table. This involves combining elements together to look to see what the product of any two elements are, so we have to learn how to multiply these symmetry elements together. It is going to be convenient for us to define some sort of coordinate system for the molecule. By convention, we used a right-handed Cartesian axis system. We placed the z-axis along the highest order rotational axis, and we placed the origin at the central point of the molecule that defines the point group. We can therefore give directionality to these different symmetry elements. So E, the C2 becomes a C2z because the rotation is along the z-axis. The mirror planes are now defined by the xz and the yz planes of our Cartesian axis system. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at different ways in which we can define these different operations. So how we can look at these visually and also how we can look at these mathematically. So here's our methylene chloride molecule and we have the atoms labeled A, B, C, and D just so we can see how they interchange positions upon doing the various operations. Doing that E operation leaves everything unchanged. A different way that we can represent this is in a more mathematical notation where we have some operator that operates on a vector that specifies our different atom positions and tells us where those atom positions end up. For E, A, B, C, and D remain in the same place, so we yield A, B, C, and D. For our C2 along Z, a and B switch places, and C and D switch places, which is specified in our resulting vector. For the sigma XZ, we have A and B staying in the same place, and C and D changing places. And for our sigma YZ mirror plane, we have B and A changing places, while C and D remains in the same place. If we look at these a little bit more carefully, then what we find is that this E representation can be represented by a 4x4 four four matrix that's just telling the atoms which positions they need to fall into. So here, if we have this square 4x4 four four matrix with 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, etc., etc., that specifies where the A, B, and C positions need to go. Therefore, our E operator looks something like this. We can do the same for the C2Z, specifying that the A and the B positions are going to change, and the C and the D positions are going to change by the 1s and the zeros exchanging places in that operator. We can do the same, construct a 4x4 four four matrix for sigma XZ and for sigma YZ. So this is a more mathematical way of looking at these operations as opposed to just looking at the change in the position of the atoms in an actual object. We can look at the change in coordinates of individual atoms using this operator element. An even more generic method would be to use our Cartesian axis system and express these different symmetry operations in terms of how they change the Cartesian axis system. So doing that E operation leaves the Cartesian axis system unchanged. So E 
times an x, y, and z coordinate will yield the same exact positions. So that E operation can be represented as a 3 by 3 matrix of x, y, and z positions that looks like this. If we look at the C2 along the Z, then what happens is X goes to negative X, Y goes to negative Y, but the Z stays the same. So this would be the resulting C2Z matrix, negative 1, 0, 0, 0, negative 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. That in the dot product of X, Y, and Z yields negative X, negative Y, and Z. The mirror plane, when we do that sigma xz, so in the xz plane, what happens is x and z stays in the same place, but the y changes to negative y. So this can be represented as such. And the mirror plane in the yz plane exchanges x to negative x while leaving y and z unchanged. So the sigma yz matrix looks like that. Its dot product on the x, y, z vector yields negative x, y, and z. So what we have are three different ways in which we can represent these different symmetry operations. We can represent them visually on the three-dimensional object. We can represent them by a large matrix that tells us how different positions are changed within that three-dimensional object. Or we can use a 3 by 3 matrix looking to see how the X, Y, and Z components change. A question you may have is, which of these should you use? Well, the answer to that question is, whichever is most convenient for the task that you happen to be performing at that time. Because regardless of what you use, you're going to get the same answer if you do your operations correctly. So let's look to see what happens if we combine the C2 along Z with our mirror plane in the XZ plane. What results when we take that product? We can do this visually. So first, starting with our molecule and doing the C2 along Z rotation, A and B switch places, C and D switch places. We then do the sigma XZ, so that's the mirror plane in the XZ plane, and that will swap our Y positions. So what we get out of that is something that results when we do a sigma YZ operation. If we do the dot product on our four by four matrix using the C2Z matrix and the sigma XZ matrix, we get the four by four matrix of the sigma YZ. And if we use the 3 by 3 matrix for our x, y, z components, then what we get out of that is the sigma y, z 3 by 3 matrix. So regardless of what we use, we get sigma y, z as the answer. The method that you would use, as I said, would just depend on the task that you have to do and what is most convenient to accomplish that task. What we're now going to do is we're going to use the visual method and the 3 by 3 matrices to generate group multiplication tables. It's just an example of how you could use these. A group multiplication table is an n by n table that shows how two elements combine to generate a third. So that a, b equals c from one of our rules of a group. This is going to look similar to the multiplication tables that you made for whole numbers in primary school, except for whole numbers, we're going to use symmetry elements. So we start by making an n by n table where we put our symmetry elements in the columns and the rows position. To determine what the product of any two symmetry elements are, we have to do this in a very specific way because it's often the time that these symmetry elements will not commute meaning that the order is going to be important. A times B does not necessarily equal B times A. So let's say that we wanted to determine what this position in the table is, corresponding to column 4, row 3. The order in which we're going to do the operations is first we're going to do the operation according to the row, then we're going to do the operation according to the column. So first we would do the sigma xz, then we would do the sigma yz. So this is sigma xz times sigma yz will equal the c2 along the z-axis. 
going through and doing this visually first. We start off with the molecule unchanged, and we're going to fill out this E column. So E times E is E. You do nothing, and then you do nothing, you get the same thing back. If we take E, and then we do a C2Z rotation on that, we get the C2Z. If you do E, and you do a sigma XZ, you get sigma XZ. If you do E, and then sigma YZ, you get sigma YZ. Coming down to the next row, we're going to start with C2Z. So this is what C2Z looks like. If you do C2Z and then you do another C2Z, you get the original molecule out. So you get E. If you do a C2Z operation and you reflect it through the XZ mirror plane, then what you get is the sigma YZ. And if you do a C2Z and you follow it by a mirror plane reflection through the YZ plane, you get the sigma XZ operation. You can do this and go through the third row and you get these elements and the fourth row and we get these elements. So what we've just done is we've completed the group multiplication table by manipulating the three-dimensional object. And so we can see that for example, sigma XZ times the C2Z gives us the sigma YZ. We know how all elements A, B transform to give element C from the group. If we were to go through and use our 3x3 three three matrices, we would find that we would get the same exact result. So um, filling out our group multiplication table in terms of matrices, just places our matrices in. The operation that we now perform is dot multiplication of the matrix. So the E times the E gives the E matrix. The E times the C2Z gives the C2Z matrix, and so on and so forth. And we can go through and do this for every single row of our multiplication table, correlating our 3 by 3 matrix with the corresponding symmetry element. And we can complete this and get our group multiplication table. So the group multiplication table that we obtain using matrix multiplication is the same as what we obtain just by manipulating the three-dimensional shapes like we saw in the previous way in which we generated this multiplication table. With this multiplication table, we can go through and show that C2V satisfies a group, that all the elements that comprise the C2V point group are in fact a group. So going through just one by one, first, looking at this, you can see that every single element in this group, AB, yields another element, C. So for example, C2Z times sigma XZ yields sigma YZ, and sigma YZ is a member of the group. You can go through and you can show that this is the case for the entire group. Every single element will do this. In addition, number two is satisfied. There's an identity element, E. We already knew this, but this multiplication table just goes to show this, that this is satisfied you can go through and show that the associativity law holds. So if we look at E, C2Z, and sigma XZ, we find out that the associativity law holds. We get sigma YZ in both cases. Same for E, C2Z, and sigma YZ. We get sigma XZ in both cases. And you go through and do this for every single combination. You can find that this is satisfied as well. Lastly, we can see that every single element has an inverse such that A times its inverse is equal to the inverse times A, which is equal to the identity element. In this case, for this particular table, what we find is that each element is its own inverse. Coming up, we're going to learn a little bit about character tables.